Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. We're looking forward to hosting our ISET Town Hall this afternoon. It's nice to see each of you here. We see a lot of friends who are connecting right now and preparing for our Town Hall. This is the opportunity to learn about all the neat things that are happening at ISET and uh, ask us some questions about things that are happening. We see our friend uh, Mercedes Alvarado uh, all the way from Puerto Rico. Mercedes, it's nice to have you on board. I just unmuted your line. Uh, tell us how you're doing and uh, how is the island looking after the after the hurricane? Um, can you hear us? I've just unmuted you. Would love to say hello. You may not have a microphone. If not, that's okay. We just wanted to check with our friends in Puerto Rico and see how everything was was going. Uh, there's no mic. She says hello, and um, hopefully uh, things are starting to get. Uh, she doesn't have a mic, but things are starting to get back to normal for our friends in Puerto Rico. So Mercedes, it's nice to have you on board today. Uh, John Spitler, nice to have John with us. Today. John is one of our longtime commissioners, and he is with us today as well. Today we will. Uh, be greeted by uh, Peter Finn. He is our chairman. He was due to come in any moment now and say hello. He is the chief learning officer for the Society of Women Engineers in Chicago. Our treasurer is Jim Barnes. He is from OSHA, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Labor. He is also in Chicago. And here are some of our other ISET officers, some other run-bys that we can take a look at, at here before uh, we begin our, uh, our webinar in just about three minutes.
Hello, everyone. Hi, Peter. I know Peter Finn has just joined us. Peter is our illustrious chairman of the board this year and next year. Peter is from the Society of Women Engineers. He's the chief learning officer. I think he's got another title called deputy executive director. Is that correct, Peter? That is correct. Yep. And that means you have a whole lot to do. <laughs> Those are two usually exclusive titles, but uh, when you've got a good person in the position and as talented as you, uh, you could do it all. Uh, Peter, uh, it's nice to have you here today. Uh, it is now four, or right at the top of the hour. We wanted to go ahead and thank everybody for being here and let you uh, just kind of introduce the concept of the town hall and welcome everybody uh, today. Yeah, thanks, Joe, um, and uh, thanks for uh, the kind remarks there. Uh, I just want to welcome everyone and, and thank everyone for, uh, for for being able to attend this afternoon. And uh, I know since the last town hall, a lot of things have gone on, and, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, all the great things that Joe and his team and all the volunteers are, are, have been up to. So uh, I guess I'll pass it back to Joe, and uh, he can kick things off. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. We have a great audience today. We are looking forward to, uh, to, to to sharing some exciting things. Let's go ahead and look at some objectives for today uh, for our town hall. We'll have several different presenters today, but we're going to look at some new requirements in the ANSI ISA 2018 standard, and we'll uh, particularly look at re-accreditation standards, uh, re-accreditation, the re-accreditation application, and some of the things that you're going to need to be aware of in the re-accreditation process. We're going to review, uh, let our Vice President of Technology, uh, Randy Bowman, talk about some of the new features at isset.org we think you'll be happy about. We are going to preview the competency-based training standard, and we'll look at the badging micro-credentialing standard. We'll update you also on the petroleum and natural gas addendum to our standard, and we'll update you on a few other exciting things uh, as we move uh, throughout the day today. As you all know, back in November, ISET launched the new ANSI ISET 1 2018 standard for continuing education and training. All the new applications for accreditation, if you submit them after, uh, if you submit them now, you will be submitting applications that are governed under the 2018 standard. I wanted to just tell you really quick, I think we reviewed this last month as well, but if you want to access the different resources that you have as an accredited provider. Now, keep in mind, this won't apply to, to individual members. It'll apply to accredited providers. But if you log in and you look here and you click under resources, you're going to notice once you log in that the little locks uh, that secure that content are removed and you will have full access uh, to the documents that we provide that are help aids in helping you meet the standard. So just a few of those, if you go to resources, standards, and application resources, if you're an accredited provider, keep in mind that you'll have a, uh, an accreditation guide. That's our policy document that tells you about the details of the program. You're also going to have a crosswalk between the 2013 and 2018 standard. So keep that in mind. We'll also have a copy of the standard itself and we'll have a copy of the application. Now keep in mind the application, it's very important that you know that the application is filled out in an online form on our website. However, some uh, providers usually like to have a copy of the application so they can see what's coming, so they can start to prepare or build their application maybe outside of the system. And then when it's time to submit, all they have to do is upload the necessary documents. So we make all that available here in standards and application resources. So keep that in mind uh, as you proceed uh, through your work with ISET. See lots of different uh, resources here. Again, some of the ones we've just mentioned. Keep in mind the 2013 standard is sunsetting. Uh, some providers, maybe some of you here today are currently under a review process. We anticipate that all reviews for the 2013 standard will be completed uh, by this May. So uh, the 2013 standard will be no more after that, even though it's important that you know that if you submitted and you were accredited under the 2013 standard, that's the standard you're accountable to. 
So you, you keep that in mind and we will keep the ANSI 2013 standard up for your reference. Uh, just keep that in mind as we, as we go through. So let's take a look right now. What I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to our Director of Accreditation and Special Projects. Uh, that is Terry Lalaberte. We're happy to have Terry with us today and she's here to tell us a little bit about uh, the reapplication process. Uh, Terry, take it away. Thanks, Joe. And I'm thrilled to be here. And I see so many names on the attendee list of folks that I have been working with in various uh, stages of their application. And so we do a regular webinar each month that goes through the application process. So I wanted to take this opportunity to really focus in on the reapplication process for renewing providers. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question if you want to, or type it into the, to the questions box and we'll try to make sure we answer it. So Joe, if you want to turn the next slide. So as you know, reaccreditation, we've tried to make it a little bit different now with the new standard. Um, hopefully we've made it easier for, for you in that as long as you are maintaining your accreditation and adhering to the standard that you accredited to five years prior, the reaccreditation process is going to ask you um, for different, different documents because it is organized differently than the original application. The original application had either 10 or nine sections uh, depending on which standard you were using. The reaccreditation application has six sections. They do correspond to the standard. However, I really wanted to just highlight what is different there. So in the first section, you're going to be just like you did in the initial application, talking about your organization. You're gonna be talking about your responsibility and control over the learning events that your organization puts on. The second section is your self-evaluations. The, the annual audit or however often you do an internal audit of your continuing education and training programs, those types of checklists and reports, we wanna see them for the last five years. I'll show you a really cool feature of the new um, reapplication as well in that it is going to grab your annual reports that you submit to ISET going forward so that we will have half of the job done for you by the time you come around to reaccreditation. The other thing we want to look at is what improvements have you been able to make in the last five years? Last When you were accredited last time, five years ago, you received hopefully some good recommendations or some food for thought or something to give you maybe another edge or different um, techniques to try or some type of an ad advice from your um, commissioner. And so we want to see, did you, were you able to implement those? Did you try it? It didn't work. Did you try something else? We just want to see what you have been doing in the past five years to grow your organization and work on that, that continual improvement. Um, the next section would be the standard compliance. This is where you would give us sample materials from your learning events for each delivery method that is employed by your organization. So if you offer only live face-to-face -face training, then you're gonna give us all of the documentation from soup to nuts of your training course. So you're going to show us your needs analysis, you're going to uh, scan your learner communications in, you're going to give us the CEU calculation worksheet, all of that type of information that shows that this course meets the standard. Um, the next section would include any continuous improvement efforts that you're making on your own, as well as the um, going back to the recommendations from the improvements in the last five years. So what is your plan for, for growth? And that takes us to the last one, which is what are your future plans? We wanna make sure that you have an eye on the future. And so that's what the reaccreditation application, that's the way it's organized. And if Joe, you'll go to the next screen, we'll talk about the different types of um, documentation that you need for the, for the reaccreditation. So in initial accreditation, you'll know that you need policies, processes, and evidence. And so what I wanted to pull out here is you still have to have those policies, process, 
and evidence because we're we're assuming that you're still using those but for the application you will be putting forth narratives um, that will detail the changes that will explain the recommendations and the impact of those changes that that you've uh, implemented we still need to look at your org charts and your staff lists making sure that you note any type of changes if positions have changed or if responsibilities have changed those types of thing, things we want to look at strategic planning documents this is I think an exciting part of the new standard in that we are asking you to think about how do you not only strategically plan for success of your continuing education and training programs, but also how do you communicate your value to your um, organization? How do you communicate the value of what your, your department or your division brings to the entire organization? And so those types of documents and that kind of of meeting and thinking and planning, we want to see evidence for. Obviously, we want to see the uh, the CEU calculations. We want to make sure that those are still accurate. And again, if you're using um, distance ed and face-to-face uh, -face live training, we're going to want to see CEU calculations for, for those two types of courses. If you're doing a hybrid or a blended type of course, we want to see the CEU calculations for that as well. We want to see your self evaluations or your self audits for, for the past five years. Um, as I said, we want to see the learning event documentation showing standard compliance. This is also going to be something that your site reviewer will really dig into um, at the site visit is looking at all of your learning events and their documentation. Um, as I said, from the uh, needs analysis to the evaluation after the, the training has been delivered. And then we'll ask to see a, a calendar of future plans. Now, Randy's going to go into a little bit more about what some of the changes are on the website, but I wanted to bring up a couple of screenshots of what the reapplication looks like when you're when you're moving through it. So you have an application dashboard when you are going through the application process. And this is so far above where we've been in terms of you understanding where you are in the process and how to uh, navigate through the application. So one of the, 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 the number one thing, and that's why I numbered it number one, is I love the fact that we now know who is responsible for the next step. That is number one up there. When you log into your portal and you go into your application, you're gonna see awaiting action by, and it may be you, it may be ISED staff, it may be one of your reviewers, but you'll always know where, uh, where the ball is. Second thing, you'll always know when your, de when your deadlines are. Um, that's again a very helpful part going forward so that folks can try to keep the application process moving in a, in a very timely manner. Um, the, the, the number three is you have options now where if you want to just view the application, if you need also to download it, it's right above there as well. Or if you want to work on your application, you have those two different buttons there as you are working on uh, submitting your reaccreditation application. You also have a little bit of a history that is there um, by number four. One thing that I also like is that it'll again tell you who did what when um, so that you have a, a sense of where things are and, and, and what step in the process. We are also now able to capture all the notifications and messages that have come through. So if you're afraid that you're not getting a notification or if you haven't gotten a message, you can now click on um, either the notifications and or the messages and you can communicate with us directly through there as well. So when clicking on messages, you would be able to send um, a message to me or to your review team or to the to the ISED staff, to the other staff members as well. Um, if you have a question or if you're coming up against your deadline and you don't know that you're going to be able to make it, things like that. So, so we wanted to make it easier for you to reach out to us through the application portal. Um, you also have access to your invoice there too. You'll see that blue number. When you click on that, it will open up your, your invoice for the application, which hopefully will make things easier um, uh, for your money folks. Uh, number number seven there is the progress bar, and again, that just kind of gives you a sense of 
where you are in the process and lets you know how much more you're going to need to to do as you go through. And as I mentioned, what I really appreciate, since I don't have to download and, and email these to folks anymore, are the uh, annual reports and any kind of information. Um, we're trying to pull that from the old system into the new application system so that you have access to those older applications and and annual reports. So all of this is, is a, there's a lot there. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you get lost on the dashboard, but there's, there's a lot of information available to you now as a provider. And if Joe, you'd go to the next slide. One thing again that I, that I really liked about the new system for you, the providers, is the transparency that you now have. So now you'll see where the, your application is. Once you have submitted your application and it has been pushed to the reviewers, um, the reviewers' progress bars will show under your, um, your dashboard as well. So you'll have a sense of, okay, well, they're about 80% done. So again, it just kind of lets you know where everything is in the process and and what's the the next step so i really do um, hope that this will make it a little bit easier for for the reaccreditation process and again the the dashboard and the transparency that's there for the initial as well but i really did want to go through a little bit more with the uh the details and the documentation required for the uh reaccreditation so thank you and uh like i said i'm here for any questions that you have regarding reaccreditation or initial accreditation. And so I will uh, um, see if there's any questions. Anybody has got their hand up and otherwise I will hand it back to Joe. All right, well, uh, as soon as we move on, we can uh, certainly still glad to answer your questions in writing. Uh, that would be fine as well. What I'd like to do now is to move to Randy Bowman, who is our technology director, <clears throat> excuse me, vice president of information technology. And Randy, I'd like to uh, turn it over to you for just a few minutes so you can tell us a few important things about the ISET website. I'm handing the presentation over to you now, and uh, we're ready to go. And uh, unmuted. There you go. Okay. Can you hear That's me? That's it. There we go. We sure can. Okay. I had both at uh, hardware um, mute and software mute. All right, thank you all for coming today. Um, a lot of what I was gonna talk about, um, Terry uh, talked about, so we'll, we'll, we'll go a, a little less on those screens and look at some of the other things that we have uh, coming up or that we've done uh, recently. So we're gonna cover uh, try to cover quickly three major areas. And um, since Terry did one of them, it should be pretty easy. So we'll start with the accreditation application module. Um, for everybody who is a uh, accredited provider or is a prospective accredited provider, uh, you'll find in your portal menu a menu item called my accreditation. This is where you can find all the information you need to work on your application. Um, and it's also another way to get to the resources Joe mentioned earlier. So they're right, there's a link to them right there underneath my accreditation and application will take you then to the same sc screen that uh, Terry just showed us. Um, and I was going to cover some of those exact same areas that she did, and she did it much nicer with numbers and legends, and uh, so I think we won't spend too much time here. Um, other than I do want to talk a little bit about the difference between the view application and the work on application. Uh, rem we sometimes uh, have, have uh, help desk requests that come in where somebody says, hey, I was working on my application yesterday and now today, all of the controls are gone. And usually what that means is they've uh, clicked on the view application instead of the work application. So that's just kind of a little gotcha 
to maybe think about um, if you happen to be uh, not be able to upload or edit your application while you're working on it, more than likely you've um, accidentally uh, chosen the wrong button. So uh, once you are ready to work on it, you would click on the work application. And um, if you are, if you have any historical applications, you'll see those there on the bottom. And you would then go to be able to actually work on the application. All right. Um, the application is generally going to be on the left side of your screen with a navigation menu item on the right side of your screen. Uh, up here in the top right hand corner is a little expand box and if you click on that it will expand all of the um, different categories so that you can see each element which is really useful once you've started working on it and you start seeing the stars or the flags um, letting you know over here on the side whether an element um, meets requirements if you've uploaded the appropriate a number of documents. Obviously, the system can't uh, determine if they're the appropriate documents, but it can count and know if you've uploaded the appropriate documents. Uh, each category has its own page with elements as tabs running at the top of the screen. So you can also switch to different elements that way when you're within a particular category. Um, so this is pretty, uh, you know, pretty, we tried to make this pretty user friendly. So you should be able to find what you need and be able to quickly upload your documents without um, much of a, a hassle. Uh, I did want to spend a little bit more time on the messaging. Um, one of the things we're trying to make sure doesn't happen is, and I'm sure everyone else has had this happen too in, in, a, in a corporate environment is, uh, a lot of times our, our Outlook or our inboxes become a, an unintended repository of knowledge. And um, information can get lost if people move on to other uh, positions or other jobs. So we really wanted to take um, the email out of this. So all of your reports that are emailed to you, you will get an email copy, are then also stored in the messages section. And that's where we would like you to use, like you to come in and use if you have a question. So if you do get a report and you have a question about it, you can click on the messages, come over and click reply right here in the system, write your message and send it, and then your, your reviewers will be notified and be able to respond appropriately. Uh, and this will keep the information that when they respond tied in with the application. So if you get a promotion and, and then in a few years your replacement's coming in and trying to follow up, you know, they don't have to come looking for you and you digging through three years worth of emails to find that piece of information. All right. Another big area we want to talk about is marketing how you can use the ISET website uh, to market yourself. And oh yeah. Do. And it looks like PowerPoint has decided to crash. So give me just a second here and we'll bring this back up. All right. Every accredited provider um, is is has a um, profile, a public profile that's available on the ISET website, and that's under Resources Accredited Providers list. This allows consumers to come in and find. Uh, who are ISET accredited providers, and of course they can search by either name or industry or country looking for what, whatever it is they want to look at. So this, one of the key things you can do is keeping your public profile up to date uh, for consumers who may be looking uh, for providers of certain kinds of information. 
So when they click on profile, they will get a screen that looks kind of like this that has your icon, um, your logo, your um, links to your social media, the training formats, and just a quick, quick brief summary of who you are and what it is you do. They can also click the accreditation certification and check and, and make sure everything is still um, up to date with by seeing your online certificate of accreditation. So these things are available on our public website for every accredited provider. So the question is, well, how do I make sure that data stays up to date? And so once you log in as an accredited provider, right there on the dashboard, you'll see a promote your membership um, box. And if you click the edit, the, the blue uh, edit, it will take you to a screen that looks an awful lot like the, um, the profile, but does have edit buttons. So you can uh, click on edit and change any one of the little components that we do uh, provide as part of your public profile. All right, so you just click edit, change the information, click save, and it'll automatically be updated on your public profile. Uh, as part of the annual review, process, uh, we will display this information to you. So every year you get an opportunity to make sure that, you know, no phone numbers have changed, links haven't changed to your website, addresses haven't changed or anything like that. Um, but you can also come in anytime and just click that edit button to update that information as well. Also on the, if you, on your dashboard of your member portal, if you scroll down, uh, you'll find a way to link to your directly to your certificate on our website. So you can copy that little bit of HTML code and send that off to your, your webmaster and they'll be able to link directly to your certificate from your page so you can tell uh, your learners that they can verify your ISET accreditation. Uh, Randy, I'd like to just jump in here and say that we have never had to send more cease and desist notices to organizations who falsely use the ISF logo than what we have in the last six to eight months. Uh, I don't know what for sure is driving that, but we have been sending cease and desist notes uh, and letters quite frequently. I think eventually ISET is going to look at any time you use our logo, uh, the AP accredited provider logo, on your website. We really would prefer and highly recommend that you help us uh, fight uh, fraudulent use of the logo by linking to uh, your certificate. Uh, that's an instant verification of your certificate and it uh, makes things very, very clear. So I can't underestimate enough if you can link your logo on your website to your specific certificate as provided here, it would be really huge uh, for us. And it would probably be something we recommend more and more as time goes on. Definitely, definitely. All right, we'll just take a look at a few other tools uh, that we have. Oh. And I, I tried a new feature that PowerPoint put out, and I guess it's not working the way it, it I guess it's not, it works great until we went uh, live in the GoToWebinar. So uh, may have to remember. That well, as Randy's summer. restarting, uh, as soon as we come up in just a moment, we're going to be looking at our badging standard. I know Rand, what part of Randy's presentation today will show a really neat new feature in that uh, ISET has uh, just made live in the last few days a new badging metadata reader. So if you have a true digital badge, you'll be able to upload it to our site to read the metadata uh, if you don't have another host or if you want to read your metadata independently of, of a host. Uh, so Randy will uh, tell us a little bit about that as he continues through the yeah. tools and resources section here. Trying to buy you a little time there, Randy. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So uh, tools and resources. Uh, one of the tools or one of the resources that, that we um, have available to everybody is our archived webinars. Um, as you know, we do monthly and sometimes uh, twice a month, bi-weekly, uh, AP Connection webinars that are free for our members. Um, 
but sometimes we can't always make those. Uh, and there's some really great, interesting topics you might want to cover. So if you do happen to miss a, a webinar, you can always come back to the resources and look up archived webinars and view the webinar um, after the date and, and get that great information. This is also where if you want to share it with it, maybe you do attend the webinar and you find out there's some great info and you want to share that with one of your colleagues, you know, make sure this is how you would send that information to them is from our archived webinar um, area. Uh, Joe already covered the standard and application resources, so we'll skip right on over that. All right, uh, open badges. Um, as Joe just mentioned, and as you're going to hear about later, um, ISET is going to be uh, proposing a, a, a certification of badging. And as part of that, we're going to want to use technology to be able to verify um, badges. So we've built a small little tool that somebody can come if they have a, a, a digital badge and actually can upload that digital badge and this tool will read all the metadata and display it to the user so that you can verify that the digital badge is indeed uh, valid. Uh, this will be really useful when we start um, with our standard and we can show that an that it's actually ISET, uh, it's an ISET certified badge uh, through using this tool. This will be the way people authenticate that a digital badge is indeed um, authentic and ha and not uh, fraudulently created, um, because that's you know we want to make sure that our learners we protect the integrity of the badge for our learners. Uh, so that can be found at the ISET.org badge validator um, URL. So that's a very, very quick overview of some of the um, things that we've been doing recently. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, obviously you can send them right here in the questions module or anytime feel free to email tech.support at ISET.org. Excellent. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and we'll be watching the uh, discussion area for any potential questions that may be uh, that may come in regarding some of the nice features that you've shared with us. Let's keep moving uh, and let's talk about the uh, open digital badge standard very quickly. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with open digital badges, let me just do a quick poll of the audience. If you uh, would like a very simple explanation on open digital badges, go ahead and raise your hand in your little applet there for uh, go to meeting and I'm going to take a quick poll and it looks like we have oh, over half of the, the group today I would like a very introductory uh, statement. Okay, if I ask you, um, if I ask you if in your courses do you issue certificates, most people would say yes. And if I were to ask you what do students do with those certificates, you might say that the student gets a job or the student uses it as a credential. Those are all metaphysical things because the physical probability is that a student goes home and if you're lucky, they put it on the wall. In the vast majority of cases, they probably put it in a folder and file it away where nobody really sees or has access to it. If they decide to scan the certificate and put it online, all you have is a certificate with a title on it, maybe a name of somebody who signed it, maybe a title for what they did, but there's no evidence, there's no, there's, there's a host of other things that cannot be included on a paper certificate, not to mention the validation is not possible. So what we have here, open digital badges essentially solves some of those issues to where uh, a digital badge is essentially a, lot, a graphics file, it's a PNG or a SVG file that has metadata behind it. Now there's an organization called, so it's, a, it's just like a picture file. Most of you are familiar with JPEGs or GIF or, or things like that. So the digital badges can be SVG or PNG. Why those? Because those files have, um, uh, can uh, associate and programmatically add uh, metadata to those, to those files that get stored. 
So you can essentially think about a digital certificate as a, um, in a simple form, a very uh, content heavy, uh, it doesn't have to be content heavy, but a very, it could be very content heavy. It has a lot of data in the badge uh, that can be portable and moved around. So there's a group that came along and they said, uh, it was called Mozilla. And uh, quite some time ago, they said, you know, if there's going to be such thing as digital badges to, to share credentials, then what we would like to do is to at least develop a technology standard that everybody can use so we can pass these digital credentials around and they can be used uniformly because it really doesn't do uh, the whole continuing education and training and educational ecosystem any good if a provider does just proprietary badges because it's only good then on their system. Well, what happens if the user wants to take those credentials off of the proprietary system and go to a new job? It should be theirs. The credentials should be portable. So those technology standards were created by a group called IMS Global now. It was originally Mozilla. It was called the Badge Alliance. And then the Badge Alliance, uh, their work was turned over to IMS Global. Today, IMS Global maintains the technology standards uh, for open digital badges, and we support that standard 100%. The new ISET standard for digital badges does not recreate the digital, uh, the digital framework for which open digital badges are on. We support the existing work of IMS Global and their uh, commitment to maintain the actual technology backend standards that uh, the structure the standards that make up the structure of the badge. So if you look at the picture here, you're gonna see that badges come with fields, certain what we're going to call metadata. It's data that's contained inside of that graphic. It's the badge name, it's the URL. And the beautiful thing is that you can program the different fields. You can create your own metadata that will actually be stored. And so when, for example, if uh, uh, one of your learners uh, finishes a program or finishes a course, uh, you could uh, provide evidence or you could provide data that tells the viewer what that learner did to earn the badge, whether they had to pass a test or maybe you wanted to uh, forward them to a URL that contained evidence. Uh, you can do all of that. But the problem is this, Microsoft, IBM, IBM is one of, the, uh, one of the largest organizations in the world and has one of the greatest vested interests in digital badges. They, they brought uh, essentially uh, attention to the fact that there are so many badges out there today. If you go online and you look for digital badges, it's the wild west. So digital badges are essentially some people, I saw a digital badge uh, just a few weeks ago uh, the user was was representing the digital badge as a digital badge, and it was a GIF file. Uh, that's impossible. It can't be. In other words, it's just a it's just a picture. There's nothing behind it. There's nothing to validate the data. It's kind of like just a static picture of a certificate. There's nothing there. A real, true, open digital badge will contain metadata and be structured on the IMS Global standards. So if you look at a badging, if some of you, I know some of our friends even online today, I know you are, you have a badging provider and your badging provider will decide whether or not they adhere to the open digital badges standard of IMS Global. I, ISET comes along and now to ensure the integrity of the metadata is what ISET will do. Because essentially right now we see people submitting badges for just about anything. And what we see here is ISET has now come along and as a part of our new digital badging standard, we're going to be examining the metadata to apply a standard to the quality, the qualitative, um, uh, uh, the qualitative components of the metadata. So let's take a look at some of the things that ISET will require in its certification of digital badges. ISET's going to, first of all, we're going to have to ensure that we promote the IMS global standard because that's the one everybody uses. It's kind of like XML, if you will. It's a, it's a universal language where badges can be read and passed from system to system. Mandatory, ISET will make mandatory certain metadata fields if you would like to certify your digital badge. So in other words, we're going to require things like first name and last name 
Uh, we're going to require an endorsement. So like on a certificate, if I ask you, uh, as a matter of fact, let me do this. How many of you in the certificates that you offer at your organization sign the certificate with a signature from a human being? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have actual signatures on your certificates. I see probably 80%, the rest of, uh, of course, most organizations do that. Well, the digital badge will require the same thing. And ISET's process will verify that that individual, who they are in the organization, what they do, and, 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 and ensure that there's integrity behind the badge. Also, we're going to be looking for evidence. Every badge will have to have evidence. So, for example, just um, one of the uh, pieces of evidence recently in a badge uh, that we were looking at uh, said that the user simply had to register for a course to get their badge. Uh, to us, in, in, and if you're going to certify an, an open digital badge, there will have to be some um, better indicator of evidence or integrity in what the user, what the learner, or what the recipient had to do to receive it. And see, so when we apply this type of standard, what we've gotten feedback from some of the largest corporations in the world and a whole task force of people who have, who have been researching this is essentially that once, if we apply this standard, it will help clean up the, the digital badging ecosystem. Now, that doesn't mean that some people will still offer badges that aren't the correct format or they, they won't really mean a whole lot or in some cases they may be even fraudulent. But when you offer an ISET badge, it's verifiable. We will have somebody look at it and determine if the metadata standards actually, um, actually are, have integrity and that meet the standard. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about this. So let's take a look at a little bit more about the badging program. The draft standard has been completed. We're just finalizing those drafts now and getting it in a good structure to publicize. Uh, the standards, uh, we, we decided to delay the launch of the badging standard into this year because our uh, board of directors and our badging task force wanted us to research what we call a taxonomy for badges. I'm gonna show you the results of that work. Uh, and essentially the big badging organizations who had the vested interest in badging said, you know, Badges, we don't really know what they even are. You can, uh, you can get a badge for just participating and doing something simple, or you can get a badge that, that really indicates some type of license. Those are two very different things. So we sent our consultants and our task force groups out to research some of these issues, and what you see is the result. This document will be available a little bit later publicly, but for right now, we wanted to give you a taste of what this will do. Now, the badge that you create that will be eligible for ISET certification will have to declare what type of badge that it is, whether it's a simple participation badge or whether the learner would have had some type of proctored assessment and it would be more applicable to a performance badge. If you gain licensure from your badge, then it should communicate that because then people and, and the large companies who are looking to digital badges will be able to make fast decisions. So for example, if you're, if you're making a decision and you require a certification or a license, you're really not going to need to look at participation badges. It's not going to, you don't even need to submit that or a contribution and recognition badge. These have essentially a really good purpose educationally, but they really don't have the rigor that would go say with a certification or license level badge. So these are some of the things that our, our task force has been working on that are gonna, I think, and I think they believe will help contribute to uh, a solid badging ecosystem. So here is where we are today. What we will look at is that badging, more standards will be available at isets.org. Uh, just keep in mind that we will be uh, publishing more about the standards soon. Uh, just stay, just stay uh, tuned to the ISET.org website and to our newsletters for more information. Competency-based training. ISET has worked hard to create a competency-based training standard. Essentially, organizations are, have essentially decided that uh, the clock hour method is not always the, the best and most efficient use of time in a training environment. That 
maybe a, a learner needs less time than what was originally allocated or in some cases more time. I'm sure all of you can attest to the dynamic nature of uh, to the dynamic nature of, of of what students may or may not need. So ISET commissioned the assessment education research experts um, to help us form a competency-based standard. And it's a different from the clock hour standards. Essentially, now ISET standard today for the CEUs, it focuses on time. So if a student's going to say get a 0.3 CEUs, then they need to be in the class, in the learning environment or online for 0.3 uh, CEUs or, or for three hours. With the, with the competency-based approach, it won't matter how long they spend. There's a, a methodology that will go with determining the competency of that person and being able to help the, the provider develop a competency model. Let's take a look very quickly. Just want to thank these people. These people are our standards development task force uh, that have uh, been uh, um, instrumental in helping us uh, forge this new highly relevant standard to industry. Uh, we also have our Blue Ribbon Task Force. Some of you will, will recognize uh, Bill Rothwell or Elaine Beek, who wrote uh, Training for Dummies. Uh, some of you will recognize Patty Phillips and uh, her husband's work on the, the Level 5 course evaluation for ROI. Uh, that comes after Level 4 in evaluation by Kirkpatrick. You'll have Level 5 by the Phillips. Patty was on our, our team and others that uh, have contributed to this standard. We also have a business advisory task force, including representatives from Chevron, Siemens, Emerson, and uh, Rotary International, as well as uh, a great organization from Singapore, which happens to be, interestingly, one of the most advanced countries in the world when it comes to competency-based training. Uh, more on that later. Here is essentially an outline of the categories in the new competency-based training standard. And here's how it works out. Levels one and two are for your providers. And keep in mind, it's very important to know that the, uh, the, the, the categories that you see are not necessarily sequential in nature. They are essentially categories that need to be addressed, but in sometimes before you ever define your learning envi environment, for example, you're gonna wanna define your competencies and outcome. So uh, the first we, the standard deals with providers, standards uh, categories three through six deal with the designer, uh, we see category seven deals with the facilitator, the facilitation of the learning, and it can be any number of different ways to facilitate the learning. That's the really interesting thing. It can happen on the job. It can happen in a classroom. It can happen online. Uh, it, we're not limited to traditional learning environments. Also, we have uh, assessments for the learners. And finally, we have an impact uh, level or category nine where you evaluate the program and then we have essentially that starts over again uh, to essentially promote a system of lifelong learning. So that's a preview of our new competency-based training standard. If um, Here's how the calendar will work on this. Um, we've just completed the first edition of the standard. It's, it's being completed right now and there'll be a CBT white paper in just in, by, by May 2018. We are going to expose this for the first time at the ATD conference, and uh, it will be on the ISET website. We'll open it for public comments for May, June, and July. We're going to finalize the second edition of the, of the standard in August, and we're going to prepare governance documents and program materials for launching a competency-based training accreditation program in the third quarter of 2018. And then we'll launch an accreditation program for competency-based training in 2019. So these are some of the things going on with what we're calling competency-based training. Finally, we have just a few minutes left, 12 minutes left in our uh, time today. So what I wanted to do is tell you a little bit about the, the petroleum. Actually, let me pause for just one moment and see if we have any questions. Uh, one of the standards for Michael J says, is, is not this uh, list in alignment with the ISET standards back in 2010? Uh, what's really changed here, Michael, is I'll tell you that the big changes in these in this in this standard is, is the focus off clock hours. And it's also, if you notice, it's the definition. It's really the creation of what we call a competency model. And that's going to be done in the needs analysis define competencies, define learning outcomes. 
that's where this standard is going to be very different from others. So, uh, and, and so really we don't have time to go into much more than that, but essentially this is a framework. What we wanted to do is this, this summarizes this whole program. We wanted to be able to have a standard that organizations could implement and to be able to implement a competency-based training program responsibly and in a quality manner and have references and research to do it. I will tell you, in many cases, competency-based approaches will not be a good solution for many training providers. In fact, there are some training situations where you will not want a competency-based training solution. But I'll tell you, in many cases, especially for larger, medium-sized to larger organizations, competency-based training is a necessity to do more with less. So I hope that answers that question some there. All right, moving on to petroleum and natural gas addendum. Just a few years ago, all of you recognized, as a matter of fact, raise your hand if you remember when gas prices hit almost a dollar a gallon here in the United States. If you remember when the gas prices hit a dollar a gallon, yeah, most of you do. When gas prices hit a hit dollar a gallon, that essentially was uh, wreaked chaos on the oil and gas industry. Over half of the employees in that industry, some people say even more, left the industry. This left major knowledge gaps in that industry. And so what's happened now is oil starts to creep back up. We see bigger company, uh, all companies starting to, to, to become more optimistic on oil. And they are slowly beginning, we're seeing a, a positive momentum in the industry. And that means they're going to have to hire new people and they don't want to learn through death and injury. You all remember things like uh, the Macondo disaster down in the Gulf of, of Mexico. Part of that was due to poor training. And the oil and gas companies have said, you know, we really don't want to relearn through death and injury. Macondo alone cost us 15, maybe 18 billion dollars. And we can take a fraction of that, reinvest in higher quality training, a higher standard and to move, move forward. So what ISET did, so what I said did is came along and there was no de facto training standard in the oil and gas industry. Now we see that there is one and I said is that standard. However, the oil and gas providers, Chevron, Baker Hughes, Tucker, Technique, Tucker Energy, ASTM and the Federal Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement wanted higher standards. They wanted I said's framework but they wanted to extend the, re the requirements. And that's where we came up with the ISET Petroleum and Natural Gas Addendum. And that addendum is essentially a list of requirements that go beyond ISETs. So a few of those things, uh, was there a question? Uh, maybe not, okay. So essentially we, uh, these companies came together and their goal is to adopt the ISET standard in contracts that companies use to solicit training providers. So for example, when Halliburton offers training or they need training, there are potentially thousands of service providers that, that work for Halliburton. And what Halliburton was a little bit tired of is getting different providers that have different standards. So what they would like to do, or what some of the organizations, or many on our list would like to do, would be to require or to endorse or to recommend ISET accreditation with the petroleum and natural gas endorsement. And then they will feel comfortable with those providers have, have the, the quality and the rigor that's necessary to maintain integrity and safety in this critical industry. So here we see that we just finished that standard and that will be uh, being uh, just put out here probably in the next few weeks. Uh, we're working to proofread it right now and everything's complete. It'll be uh, out in uh, late March or early April. Oh, by the way, I was going to tell you this as well. ISS, mark your calendars for those of you who are interested in ISS Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, Continuing Education and Training um, Program. We are gonna have a live symposium. We're expecting over 100, 150 people to be in Houston, Texas on September 12th. On September 12th, we're gonna talk about issues unique to oil and gas. We're gonna look at the ISET addendum. We're gonna be able to go over that. Also, the ISET addendum was designed 
to meet other standards that are not quasi, they're, they're quasi training standards, they're low level training standards, but ISET's standard or addendum complements those of the American Petroleum Institute, the International Association for Drilling Contractors, and other key organizations where we took our addendum and essentially made sure that, that our addendum synced with the standards in those other industries. So when you do the ISET standard, you're meeting the other standards already, which is a huge marketable uh, eff efficiency factor here for ISET and for the, the people who will be using and adopting this standard. Also too, here's just a few new things. ISET has, uh, we have uh, engaged the Asia Pacific like never before. If any of you are interested in hosting a webinar in the middle of the night here in North America, uh, feel free to contact us. You can go to iset.in or iset.org slash Asia Pacific, and you can uh, submit a webinar proposal there. Uh, if Asia Pacific isn't your, your uh, area, then uh, you, uh, we've already chosen our webinars for this year. But Asia Pacific, we have a, probably about a thousand different providers and different people who are in, that we engage on a monthly basis in the Asia Pacific alone. And after our recent trip to uh, India, after our come, upcoming trip to Singapore, uh, we wanted to dedicate and to engage this region of, of, of literally over 2.3 billion people. Um, it's a massive, it's a massive group, and they are in need of high quality training standards. Also, too, one of the things that is really going well for ISET is our adult learning workshop. Now, I would bring your attention to one of our latest newsletters. The latest newsletters say that uh, says that. Uh, the, the adult learning workshop is a great way for you to help comply with your standard. One of the things that we ask in, in the standard, there's two specific standards that de uh, deal with uh, the ability of what your instructional designers and your instructors to be familiar with adult learning. And one of those standards says that you're going to incorporate adult learning principles into your instructional design. And then it says that your instructors and your instructional designers have some type of professional development plan of their own that focus on teaching skills, not just content, not just the subject matter, but literally on how to teach and convey information in a quality meaningful way. So I have said if, if instructors go through our program, it will actually be a credit to the organization to be able to document that during their reaccreditation process because our adult learning program is essentially a condensed two day program on, on, uh, on how to teach adults. And it's a lot of fun, it's really great, and the cost, we've tried to keep it down, so it's very, very reasonable. All of our adult learning workshops can also be taken remotely uh, in our interactive classroom, although you do have to have a webcam because we're talking to you face-to-face -face, uh, during those sessions. So it's a very highly interactive and engaging session. So here are your, essentially your, your email addresses and names for those of us at ISF if you'd like to contact us with questions. And uh, we appreciate your support. We see a lot of people thanking us for our webinar today. We have about three minutes left for any additional questions that you may have. We, uh, we are grateful for all of you and the time that you spent today. Um, is there any additional questions about any of this? If not, we'd be happy to take your emails and we'll just... Uh, Joe, we have, I think, one question. I have a, I have a, an attendee with her hand up. Tanika Bennett, I'm going to unmute you. Sure, go right ahead. We can hear Hi. you. Hi, I just had a quick question about the digital badging standard. Are you guys going to offer more webinars about the digital bad, badging in the future? Great question. Yes, we're going to do a whole series on it. As a matter of fact, if you go to our website right now, if you go back to this website, if you go to iset.org forward slash connection webinars, you can also get there by just clicking on events. We call them CET connection webinars. Uh, you will see our next, uh, our next uh, uh, one hour webinar on badging. Uh, we've also got another one, an introductory session to badging that's already up there and recorded. Uh, we're also going to be using, and I see, 
Uh, we're also going to be having some blog articles that come out in regard to that. And what we hope is to be one of the key sources that you turn to on quality digital badges. Uh, in fact, I think one day, probably later this year, we may even have a symposium on digital badges. Uh, as a matter of fact, just out of curiosity, how many of you, if it were in, um, you know, it, it held either online or held live, how many of you would be interested in a symposium on digital badges, where it was a whole day on this, on, on using them to, um, uh, to to motivate your learners and how you implement those in the organization? And this gives me a good idea of of how we can plan to take your to take your uh, feedback. All right, we've got quite a few, and that's interesting. I think digital badges is going to be one of the hottest topics in continuing education. It's certainly one of the things we include in our uh, global trends in continuing education and training presentations. All right. You know, we, have, I, we have another question. Sure, go right ahead. Um, I'm just going to read this one. Is The question is, are there any industries or licensing boards preparing to move to competency-based evaluation of their licenses for license renewal versus clock hours seat time? <laughs> I love Joanne. Later. So, I will tell you this. Here's the bottom line, Joanne, in just 30 seconds. Government, government training regimens mandate clock hours. That's not going to root out of statute or regulation anytime soon. Primarily, we see uh, clock hour and seat time movements in organizations that need to do more with less and are independent of regulatory structure. However, that doesn't mean that the competency movement won't catch some of them. Uh, so we are there to educate. That's a role that we hope ISEC can play in providing an education to regulatory agencies. I'll tell you, Joanne, you want to you wanna get underneath a regulator's skin? Ask them this one question. So we require 15, 16 hours of clock hours of instruction for our continuing education every year. Why do we require that many clock hours of instruction? And if you ask them, they usually don't know. Usually I will tell you those decisions are, they pull those numbers out of the air for what they think other states do or other countries, and they really don't know. And that's because the government, Joanne, as you probably know, can't define competency. They can't afford to do it. And do you really want competency being defined by your government bureaucrats? Uh, no offense to government bureaucrats, they serve a strong regulatory purpose. But so anyway, that's uh, right now, that's what we see on competency based training. We are not going to supplant uh, regulation and, and statute that mentions clock hours anytime soon. All right, I think that's it. Uh, Terry, anything else from you? I'm going to do I'm going to unmute Deborah Graham. If she has a question, she has her hand up. Let's see if she's uh, able to uh, connect with us. Deborah, those may have been left over from the previous uh, from the previous it, question. I'm not sure, but um, whatever you have time for, Terry. Nope, and that's that's all we have for right now. Then I don't see anybody else with their hand up, and you seem to have answered the questions that have come in through the chat. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. We're just a couple minutes over. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Peter, for all that you do and your support of ISET. We wish you all the best. Have a great day. Thank you.